Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for coming. Um, the, I'm one of the three uh, principal investigators on uh, the Conspiracy and Democracy Project, which for those of you who uh, don't know, it is a five-year leadership funded um, project um, investigating three aspects of conspiracy theorizing um, as phenomenon. One of which is a historical strand led by Sir Richard Evans. One of them is a political theory strand led by uh, David Runciman. And I run the internet strand, which is trying to figure out what difference does the internet make, a topic which has become very interesting in the light of recent events in the United States. Um, we, as, as part of the project, we have um, regular public lectures, of which this is one. Um, but we also have sometimes symposia and, and uh, conferences, or not, uh, symposia of various kinds. Um, our speaker tonight is um, Ian Loughlin, who is a senior lecturer in the School of History, Classics, and Archaeology at the University of Edinburgh. His research interests are Russian history, particularly the history of the Russian Revolution and the Stalin era. He's also interested in Russia's relations with the West and the history of intelligence, conspiracy, and espionage. His PhD thesis and first book were on the Tsarist secret police based on research in the newly opened Russian state archives. After that, he took up a research fellowship at Helsinki University in 1999, which, with Finnish Academy funding, provided him with access to the former Communist Party and KGB archives uh, in Moscow. This led to a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship at St. Cross College uh, in the other place from 2001 to 2004, and after that to a lectureship at Stirling University. And since 2010, he's been teaching history at Edinburgh University. Um, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were in, in uh, Berlin, and we went to the Stasi Museum for the first time, um, which was an amazingly interesting experience. Eerily, when we got to it, uh, I kept seeing an image of someone who looked familiar. And after a while, it dawned on me that it was um, Felix Dzerzhinsky. Um, and the reason he looked familiar was because I had been looking up Ian's background. Um, and there he was. So given the subject of our research project, he was a natural, uh, Ian was a natural invitee to, as a lecturer. Tonight, he's going to be speaking about conspiracy in the Kremlin and the question of who or what. So, Ian, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, in, in Russia, it wouldn't be normal to explain who, who Felix Dzerzhinsky was, because he's, uh, he's very famous there. But uh, I often find I, I don't know how famous he is outside uh, Russia, so I'll explain a little bit. Here's him with uh, a pal of his, uh, Joseph Stalin. We'll, we'll go into whether they got on or not uh, in the course of this uh, lecture. He was the founder of the, the Soviet secret police. Uh, he, uh, he did a lot of other things too. He was really in, in charge of an organization called Vesenko, which is really uh, in charge of the economy. He also started Moscow Dynamo uh, football team, start, started the Russian film industry. Uh, he built lots of orphanages. Uh, he fought typhus, he organized snow clearance, he made the trains run on time. Uh, but uh, as well, what we mostly know is that he killed an awful lot of people as head of the secret police from 1917 to 1926, uh, when he dies uh, in, in July of 1926, uh, only, at the age only of 48. Hence, a lot of whispering uh, went on uh, surrounding his death. But he's somebody who, if you're in Russia or if you watch Russia, you'll see that he's, a, he's, he's something that transcends the, even this sort of uh, small period of his significance, because... His cult of personality lasted not just for the whole of the, the Soviet regime, but beyond it. Uh, when Barry Sperazovsky was, was interrogated by Putin in Putin's office in the FSB in 1999, there was a bust of Dzerzhinsky on the desk. When the Soviet Union fell in uh, uh, 1991, uh, the, the, the symbolic moment which showed that the regime had fallen was pulling the statue down of Dzerzhinsky in front of the Lubyanka. You know, it was, so, it was so powerful, this image, that the, the Americans arranged a kind of copycat uh, pulling down of a statue of Saddam Hussein in, in, in Iraq. Where, and, you know, they wanted to recreate that sort of glorious moment when another dictatorship fell. The statue sits in a, an abandoned park now in Moscow, and they keep debating whether to bring it back. Uh, uh, the, the, the overwhelming uh, 
uh, response is mostly they do want to bring it back, strangely enough, and put it back in its spot in front of the Lubyanka in the centre of Moscow. So he, he's a complicated person. He's clearly hated in Poland, though. There's his statue on, the, on your left um, being pulled down in Warsaw in 1989. So the toppling of his statue not only symbolised the fall of the Soviet Union, but symbolised the fall of the whole Soviet bloc. You can also find lots of his images in Russia. I've got, I've got him on a T-shirt, for example. Uh, you can get him on mugs. You can get him on mouse mats. You can buy his poster. Uh, this is a colorized version of his most iconic picture, uh, which outsold uh, uh, posters of Vladimir Putin for a while. So he is, he is very popular. Even Vladimir Putin with his shirt off. Uh, you know, so he, he does well. Uh, he, he, he's, he's seen as somebody who transcends the Soviet experience and represents some kind of ascetic uh, uh, corruption fighter, a crime fighter who can be trusted. Uh, they don't seem to mind that he was a, an extremely ruthless person. In fact, uh, it's seen as one of his virtues. Okay, so the way I sort of explain this in, 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 in a kind of a tortured uh, analogy is, is a bit like some kind of murder mystery, the reason why his death attracts conspiracy theories. The moment he died in, uh, on the 20th of July, 1926, uh, people started making all kinds of rumours about that, you know, this can't have happened by accident. Uh, the reasons why they think it can't have happened by accident, the one thing is it happens in a closed location, which everybody doesn't really know. The, the Kremlin's been closed to outsiders since about 1918 and will not really be open to tourists and so forth until the mid-1950s. So in a perfect locked room mystery, he's just there in a central committee meeting with uh, the, uh, the leaders of the party all arguing over policy. He has a heart attack, it seems, while he's giving a speech, having a ferocious attack on some deviationists from the party line. So it seems to fit into a nice trajectory for people, particularly the, the, the speculators of the white emigres and the, and the sort of Russophobes abroad. Uh, the Times points out at the time, you know, as usual, there are many who mistrust the official announcements and whisper rumours of a violent death. Um, I'll, I'll show press cuttings in a minute. There's a lot of rumours. Uh, you know, this fits into the trajectory. You know, the, the Kremlin's always had this notorious reputation. There's uh, Anastasia Romanova, the, 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 the link to the Romanov line, who married Ivan the Terrible, sorry, was the mother of Ivan the Terrible. And, uh, and was probably poisoned inside the Kremlin. Ivan the Terrible himself then, as a result of the kind of claustrophobic, paranoid atmosphere in the Kremlin, uh, became, you know, as a result of this suspicious and violent person. There he is uh, uh, holding his son, who he himself killed in the Kremlin after getting to an argument uh, with the son. What had happened was, uh, in a fit of rage, uh, Ivan the Terrible had uh, whacked with a stick uh, uh, his son's wife in the stomach, and she was pregnant at the time. She miscarried. The son flew into a rage at, at Ivan Grozny, and he then battered his own son to death, there ending the, the royal line. And this, this ended that dynasty. Uh, Peter the Great, the, the Kremlin, is incredibly formative on his paranoia too. He, at the age of 10, the, 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 the painting below shows he watched his uncles dragged away from him and hacked to death inside the Kremlin. Uh, this made him uh, incredibly uh, suspicious of Moscow as a whole, but particularly the, the claustrophobic, again, cl closed atmosphere of the Kremlin where palace coups were very easy. Hence, it drove him to uh, found St. Petersburg. And finally, someone we'll come back to in a while, um, Joseph Stalin, of course, all kinds of... Uh, he lives uh, until the mid-1930s, until 32, really, until another suspicious death in the Kremlin. Uh, his wife sitting there, one of the few photos that are together, after uh, the 15th anniversary celebrations of the October Revolution, uh, shoots herself. Uh, the main cause of death was probably that Stan had been flirting with some other women on the nights. He'd been throwing food at them, which was Stan, uh, Stalin's stylish way of <laughs> showing that he was on the pull. Um, but some people thought maybe he murdered her. They released the news to press that she died of appendicitis, and her own daughter thought for decades that she died of appendicitis, but actually she'd shot herself. Uh, so the, this location does tend to attract conspiracy theories. There's also the, the, the question of the timing Luckily, I managed to find out there was some Russian emigres who went to the, the Hoover Institution. You, there's not much you can find in Moscow on, on the conspiracy theories because uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the official line was that he died of natural causes. But thankfully, the white emigres had, had written a lot. So I went to the Hoover Institution. There was a, a lot of sort of collections of white emigres there. And I found you know, piles of these kind of newspaper cuttings, all speculating on various theories as to who had killed him. The reason why they speculate is the timing. The party seems to be entering that kind of... Uh, 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 Thermidor phase, where it's, it's just about to sort of fall apart. Everybody's arguing with each other. The white emigres don't know why they're falling out with each other, and so they tend to speculate, and they don't really know what's going on, but they know, that, they know enough from the, the Trotskyites who are le leaking information out that they're, they're all falling apart. 
So there's all kinds of theories there. One is that they force Dzerzhinsky to commit suicide. Another that he just does kill himself. Another that he's been a, a, a narcotic ad addict and, uh, and, and this has brought about his death. Um, others, though, that particularly the Jews in the party, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, have murdered him. Interesting that Stalin is never mentioned in any of these conspiracy theories at the time. My favourite one, though, is a report here. Um, this is here. It's, it's very weird to have, find yourself reading Russian views of British press. It's they're reporting on the, the Daily Mail, um, ever reliable. <laughs> the Daily Mail apparently say that, you know, they're, they're not actually blaming it on immigrants. They're saying um, that, uh, uh, that uh, there's, a, there's a Captain Carr who's written to the Daily Mail and they published a story saying that he's just been excavating Tutankhamun's tomb and he said he found in hieroglyphs a prediction that Dzerzhinsky would die on this date. Uh, written by the, the pharaoh several thousand years before. And so, you know, ever interesting versions of events coming from the Daily Mail. So, the, <laughs> so, so this does send, it does, you know, this isn't a minor event in Russia. This is, this is the moment they think, a bit like when Robespierre dies, that the revolution is about to devour its own children. The, the timing of this could not be, you know, more clear cut um, if we go down the picture. The reason for this is, this is the last time you see the old guard of old Bolsheviks together. They all gather together. Uh, for Dzerzhinsky's funeral. Uh, you can see from the picture, probably there's Stalin at the front in white. They seem to have color co coordinated themselves for the funeral. There's Bukharin there, the writers there. There's a Molotov man who lived to see something Gorbachev uh, there. Um, there's further over Rikov, uh, there's Kamenev over here, and Trotsky back there, all carrying the coffin. The last show of unity before they all start hurling insults at each other and falling out. So this, in a classic murder mystery, though, as well, not only have you got this location, you've got timing, but you know, you always have in a murder mystery a deserving victim, someone who's managed to make a lot of enemies. So everybody picked up on this time, so I'll give you some foreign press reports which, which report more honestly on this, the Time magazine saying, a huge crowd milled around in seeming indifference, whiffs of smoke ascended from many pipes, occasional sporadic laughter was heard as jokes were loosed. Felix Zerzhinsky, respected, fear, feared, was never popular. You can pick this up a bit from the... The footage of the funeral, uh, Stalin seemed to be looking a little bit sort of uh, smug during this time. He even giggles to himself at one point when he nearly drops the coffin. So it doesn't seem to be so somber as other. Maybe because it's July as well, maybe they're all in a good mood. Uh, the statue, I think, is um, I, I'd managed to discover was there was an original statue planned for in front of the Lubyanka, not the one you saw toppled in 1991. Uh, this one was designed in, uh, well, based on a, a sculpture from life in 1925. Uh, finally finished in 1938, but never actually uh, put up. And the, the point about the statue is, he's not the kind of comforting, reliable, solid, bureaucratic figure of the statue of 1958, which went up. He's a much more terrifying, frightening person. And so then, even if you look at Dzerzhinsky Zamorazin, he's a person that makes everybody nervous, a person with lots of people uh, would like to see dead in many ways, because it would make them feel a lot more uh, safe. As, as you know, someone who liked him said, he referred to him as the most sinister, the most feared, the most Herod-like figure that semi-barbaric Russia has produced. He's one of his closest friends, Radak, said, you know, he died just in time. He was a fanatic. He would not have shrunk from reddening, reddening his hands now blood. So that worried that he's Robespierre and he's about to start chopping heads off inside the party. So you add to this then, add to the, the mix, is the fact that he has quarreled with all of the leading uh, party figures. And like, again, you know, if I, I, I was thinking about having them as all Cluedo characters, but I thought it might test your patience a bit much. But to explain his, the, the, the beefs that various members have with him, uh, Trotsky has argued with him badly about the idea of openness of the party, which Dzerzhinsky hates, about party democracy, which Dzerzhinsky hates. Uh, Zerzhinsky thinks of collective rule as the right thing. He hates Trotsky for the reason that Trot he thinks Trotsky is about to sort of become some kind of Napoleonic figure. Kamenev and Zinoviev on the left, Zerzhinsky's argued about uh, the uh, economic policies. About uh, he, he, Zinoviev and Kamenev want to bleed the peasants dry, really, of all their resources. Uh, Zerzhinsky is much more of a supporter of this soft line on NEP. Uh, and this, these are the targets of his frenzied speech he gives on the 20th of July, which seems to induce this heart attack. Or, as uh, some people claim, it was a glass of water he was drinking, actually, is, uh, is the other claim. Hopefully this isn't... No, <laughs> uh, uh, and the, the final one, Bukharin, they'd argued in 1924 very badly because Bukharin said the closer the revolution comes to victory, 
we should scale down uh, repression. Uh, Zerzhinsky argued the opposite. He said we should uh, scale up the police, and he very much resented uh, this encroachment on his power because he, 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 it was his personal creation, the security police. He saw this as a personal attack on his position. This was his uh, darling, and it, this was his, uh, his, his reason to be senior in the party. This was clearly atta an attack meant to remove him. Okay, the way in which I can pull apart this theory then at first, and, um, and I can move on, I suppose, is the fact that no, none of these people were accused later on by Stalin of killing Zerzhinsky. You'd think if there was anything in these rumours that Stalin would have done this. If anything, then, Zerzhinsky is the unity candidate because he agrees with Trotsky on uh, permanent revolution, for example. Uh, he agrees with Zinoviev and Kamenev on security policy. He agrees with Bukharin on economic policy. So if anything, the fact that he has these little differences shows in a way that he's in the middle because he's having differences with left and right. So a, a month before he died, he sort of wrote a kind of letter of re uh, reproach uh, to leading party members saying, you know, you've got to stick together. Without unity, th Thermidor is inevitable. Leninists will devour each other like spiders. He was the last piece of cement really holding these two factions together, the left and the right. We can see as well that what happened in the 90s was that um, someone came across the fact that while they were in Politburo meetings, they were all doodling all the time. So the top picture there is Bukharin's doodles while he was bored in meetings. And one thing it shows is when in the minutes they're arguing with each other, but uh, on the doodles, they're, they're kind of getting along well. Dzerzhinsky and, um, and Bukharin in this meeting are clearly sitting next to each other. Um, to take the mick out Dzerzhinsky while they're supposedly arguing, Bukharin sketches uh, Dzerzhinsky there and draws a sword of him saying, you know, the, the, the avenging sword of the revolution and so forth. He passes it to Dzerzhinsky like a schoolboy in class saying, look, I've drawn a picture of you. Dzerzhinsky writes, oh, you've forgotten to draw a tiny little Bukharin blunting the blade of the revolution. <laughs> so Bukharin obliges and he draws a little, little doodle of himself. So this is, um, when we look at the minutes at first, we think they're arguing, but we look at these little things, we get indications that this hasn't reached the murderous levels of the 1930s. And so this is the thing. The reason why we think there's conspiracy theories is, of course, what happens afterwards. And this is a way of reading history backwards. I mean, there's something that's just happened a year before Dzerzhinsky died. It's the head of the army, uh, Mikhail Frunzia, the man in the, the top left corner there. Uh, he's persuaded by Stalin to have an operation that he doesn't need and dies from uh, overuse of anesthetics. And so people were gossiping a bit about that. that uh, he, he thought he had a stomach ulcer. They open him up and there's no stomach ulcer. But whoops, they gave him too much chloroform. He dies of that shortly afterwards. Uh, Menzhinsky, conveniently, he's the man in the top right, conveniently dies in 1934, um, just in time to get Yagoda in charge to start pursuing a more aggressive line against party opposition. Uh, uh, Maxim Gorky, the man in the bottom left, dies just before the show trials begin in 1936. Again, very coincidentally, very usefully, because uh, Gorky would not have supported uh, this trial of the old guard and the lies that were, were perpetrated there. And most famously of all, inside the Kremlin, or John Akidji there, the man who's dead in the corner on the bottom right, uh, argues with Stalin, and he possibly shoots himself, or he's shot. Uh, they issue in the press uh, the lie that it's um, heart failure, but if you put a bullet through your heart, I suppose your heart does stop, so uh, it's, it's not really... Uh, it shows that there are such a thing as sort of lies being, being presented to the public about violent deaths, uh, and the track record there. So this has inspired many things, but particularly I, I just put, put this book in the middle, which is a classic case of the paranoid style, uh, is a book on the secret life of Joseph Stalin. The central conceit of the book is, um, like some kind of original sin, which Stalin's constantly trying to cover up, is that uh, Stalin worked for the Tsarist secret police. Uh, Dzerzhinsky's in charge of the archives of the Tsarist secret police. So the theory put forward there is to establish the motive uh, that Dzerzhinsky uh, comes across a file proving that uh, Stalin had been an Akhrana spy for the Tsar. And so in order to cover up this crime, uh, Stalin has him murdered. I'll give you an example of the, the kind of uh, the paranoid style here that probably would sum this up. Let's go to maybe an extract from, from Brackman. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll quote from memory. He says, he says, during the speech, Dzerzhinsky takes a sip from water and then appears to clutch his chest and collapses in front of alarmed delegates. 
Uh, from this point, uh, they sneak him out of the building. Um, he's, he's, he's dropped dead there and then, apparently. Um, and they sneak him out of the building in front of these 200 people in the audience in the Central Committee meeting and take him back to his flat and then fake his death there in his flat. He then says to cover this up, uh, there's no autopsy, there's no investigation, the body is cremated and uh, his ashes are immured in the Kremlin walls, not his body. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, that this can be sort of disproven on every single level, thanks to the, the wonders of YouTube. Um, who thought I'd be using YouTube to sort of <laughs> disprove a theory? Let's get through to three minutes. But Dzerzhinsky had organised Lenin's funeral. Uh, hence, that's why he was the founder of the film industry. He didn't like film himself. Famously, the only film he watched was this film he made of Lenin's funeral. But um, in, in, in memory of this, they make a film of Dzerzhinsky's funeral as well. Um, they, you can, you, basically, what you can see here is, first of all, they have the lying in state. He lies in state in the House of Unions, where they later have the show trials. The body's clearly there. Um, they just show all the, the leading figures, but it gets about three minutes. There's his body, lying in state. Uh, they then take him in an open coffin um, through from the House of Unions, just a kind of ten-minute walk, more or less, to, to Red Square. Uh, they, they, you can see them all carrying there, so this is what the photos were of. And the coffin is open, and... Uh, there's not too many bits that maybe you can see, and maybe I don't have time to show you, but trust me, and I'll happily uh, show you uh, where you can find it. Just look up Felix Dzerzhinsky's funeral on YouTube. Uh, this, is, this could not be more public, you know. If they, if they, if this is not someone burying in secret the ashes. Uh, by about seven minutes, they probably show the body going into the ground. There's, La there's Stalin at the front. There's Rikov. There's Trotsky. Um, there's, all, there's all the senior party members there to, together. This is not some cover-up at all. I remember to press pause now because YouTube just gives you some shocks. Okay. So the problem then is, is that this doesn't really uh, dispense with conspiracy theories. What's happened in Russia is I saw a, t a television documentary where they said, well, yes, there is an autopsy, but the autopsy itself is highly suspicious. And they've got some points, I suppose. The main point they have is all of the people who uh, carry out the autopsy carry out the later autopsies of people who we know for certain were killed, people like Johnny Kidja or were killed violently, like Stalin's wife. And it, they, they lie in their autopsy reports in the 1930s. Not only that, some other people accuse uh, some of these doctors who carry out the autopsy of murdering Dzerzhinsky in 1938 in the show trial then. Stalin was about to start accusing lots of people, just when he died, basically, of murdering Felix Dzerzhinsky. He was going to make it a big part of the doctor's plot. He was going to go that far back. And in 1953, these doctors luckily escaped because Stalin dies just in time. Which will, of course, later be the subject of conspiracy theories too. Um, but the fact that Stalin does accuse people of doing this uh, the thing is, Stalin has this kind of uh, a Trump-like habit of accusing people of things which he has done himself. Uh, when he accuses someone of carrying out a murder, it's probably because he's done it himself. Khrushchev uh, summed this up best, just, so, just to show that I'm not being too Freudian. Other people did think this too. He said Stalin had developed very fine methods for killing people. Now he was projecting all this back on himself, thinking, uh, why couldn't these people who want to see me wiped off the face of the earth use similar methods against me? So what you often get is what Stalin accuses other people of you can bet that he's probably done something similar himself. Should go next page. Um, well, let's, 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 let's dwell on this point here. The thing I think the point is here is it's taking Stalin out of context. What we have really is Stalin of the 1930s being projected backwards into 1926. Now, the way I can show this in a visual way, I would say, is, is some of these pictures here. These are photos of Stalin in 1930. Um, he wasn't paranoid then. He wasn't accusing people of murdering party members then. And I think the reason he, he wasn't is because he wasn't doing it himself yet then. He didn't think that terrorist acts on members of the party will be carried out. Uh, one thing you notice about a lot of these photos, I've seen lots of these pictures in, when he's wearing the same outfit, so I presume it's been taken on the same day in 1930 at the 16th Party Congress, is the passers-by in the street uh, don't notice him at all. This is a usual thing that Stalin walks around throughout the 1920s. And it's in 1930 that he's ordered by the Politburo to stop doing this. They say, come on, you know, you're risking your life doing this. There might be assassins out there. So Stalin is not paranoid at this point in time. I think the change in his personality begins when his wife commits suicide in 32, 
but escalates as a result of uh, the opposition to him between 1930 and 1934 as a result of collectivization and so forth. So to, the idea that Stalin's going around poisoning people in 1926 is anachronistic, I think. So to take it to context then, I think the explanation which is going to take some kind of, uh, I suppose, um, uh, move forward, which is the criticism then of the, the autopsy was they only opened the chest cavity and looked inside there and they concluded it was heart disease. Uh, the criticism of this um, has been that they didn't have a look inside his head. I think it's irrelevant in that physical sense to peer inside his head, but I think to set him in context, Dzerzhinsky, looking inside his head on a metaphorical level, you, you get a closer understanding of why it is uh, that he dies. And, I'll, and so bear with me, it'll take me about 10 minutes to work through this, but I will get to the point. The context then, I think, is the fact that Dzerzhinsky, as this fearsome figure, is, is a kind of uh, pantomime villain, an act which he's invented himself. He comes from this age, this new age of this sort of new cult of personality. Kaiser Wilhelm, I think, was the groundbreaker in this sort of setting himself up, having film crews follow him. And the best thing about Kaiser Wilhelm is he's even branded himself. He's got a W in his moustache on his face. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it goes for that sort of Hitler approach, which is that anybody can draw Kaiser Wilhelm. All you do is just draw a round face and do a W on the face, and there you go, you've got him. Uh, the fact even Lenin was dragged into this kind of thing of the cult of personality. The idea that the new political uh, leaders had to be actors, had to be performers. Uh, uh, you know, this is also the point when you get the kind of Reagan syndrome, which unfortunately we're, we're finding now has, has come back to haunt us, uh, which is that you know, public performers also turn to politics. Uh, the man there speaking to the huge crowd is Douglas Fairbanks, who was very politically active, you know, the, the sort of king of Hollywood, uh, you know, Mary Pickford, Pickford's husband. Uh, they actually attended Dzerzhinsky's funeral, by the way, the only famous people from abroad who did. Uh, uh, but the other thing that's going on at this time, actually, is, that, is the cult of personality as it's building up in the Soviet Union is an uh, attempt to appeal to a new wide mass audience. And Dzerzhinsky is at the cutting edge of this. He's involved in the embalming of Lenin. He's created this mythical persona of, as, as some kind of ferocious, ascetic uh, figure. Uh, the thing I think you can, you can connect this to, and I'm only being half silly when I say this, is also the fact this is the cult of the superhero who is born in the West at this point in time. The Soviet cult of personality ha had this kind of juvenile appeal. Even the names sounded like superheroes. After all, Stalin was the man of steel. Kamenev was the man of stone. Molotov was the hammer. I mean, you could say they were superheroes or maybe wrestlers. Uh, Iron <laughs> Felix, after all, was Dzerzhinsky's uh, moniker. Uh, Hitler as well is of course a person at this time which I think links to this that the cult of personality should not be understood as projecting someone as lovable and nice Hitler didn't try to do this this, you know, this is Heinrich Hoffmann's uh, the, his photographer taking pictures of Hitler rehearsing speeches Hitler wasn't trying to be lovable he was trying to be memorable he was trying to project a certain image of, of a passionate proselytizing figure these photos are not Hitler speaking these photos are of Hitler practicing positions and poses for his speech it just shows how contrived the whole public appearance was. They weren't really being themselves, they were acting a part. So Dzerzhinsky, as, as this demonic figure, I think fits into that same category. His wife later said that he was obsessed with the uh, opera Faust. A famous Russian that was at his funeral was uh, Fyodor Shalyapin, who's the, the, the man playing Mephistopheles in Faust here on the left-hand side. Uh, Dzerzhinsky seems to have modelled himself quite a lot in the way he's referred to. Uh, when he dies, after all, the Soviet press says, says that, you know, that uh, uh, enemies cower at his name because he's a demonic, almost satanic figure. These are direct quotes from Pravda. Uh, uh, Dzerzhinsky himself loved, he used it as his own Harry Lime style signature theme tune. He uses a code for when he was in the underground. He would put the gramophone record of Faust on to let people know he was in the building. He, was, he developed quite an obsession with it. So his, his, his depiction as this demonic figure is not accidental. It's a deliberate act to terrify his enemies. The statue itself showed that Vera Mukhina, the sculptor, understood this. Uh, her biographer has discovered that she based the look of this statue on visits to uh, the ballet. Uh, and she based it on some of the actors in La Silphide and uh, La Bayadere. Um, so in La Silphide, she based, she based the look on, on a Scottish witch, a female character, and from La Bayadere, from this sort of oriental despot is in the thing. And the look is very much a... It's, the, the biographer said it was meant to be a, a ballet pose and a dramatic pose. It was the idea of uh, Felix Dzerzhinsky as performer. So this gets the point then where I can quote from 
uh, the autopsy. What, how this links then to this cult of personality is that Dzerzhinsky was acting this demonic role, but he didn't want to be seen purely as a villain. He was meant to be villainous to his enemies. His model, really, at first, I suppose, on a political overt level, conscious level, maybe not his model on an unconscious level, was Maximilien Robespierre, the man who's illustrated there on the right. Uh, and you see Felix Dzerzhinsky here uh, a few weeks before his death, and you can see they have something in common. They both seem to have worked themselves to the point of death. And the way we can understand then the cult of personality linking to this is that Dzerzhinsky was hugely envious of Robespierre because Robespierre wasn't loved in his lifetime. Robespierre was loved afterwards as a martyr to the revolution. And the one thing uh, Dzerzhinsky lacked, he knew as a good Catholic boy, that to be a martyr you've got to die. Uh, so Dzerzhinsky was deliberately working himself to death, so he was the author really of his own demise. We can see this from the autopsy. Uh, the autopsy shows a person who's been very aware for some time that um, uh, he's had uh, heart disease. They say it's a result of the paralysis of the heart. They, they point out that um, there was thrombosis in the major peripheral arteries, fatty deposits on the inner wall of the aorta, thickening of the muscle of the left ventricle. Uh, we know this is part of a long, this is not part of some poisoning then, but part of a long-standing heart disease because there's records of his, uh, from his Tsarist prison period of having thrombosis in his legs uh, in, in 1916. His health collapses completely in spring 1917, just when the revolution breaks out. The, the stress is too much for him, so he has to take a month off right in the middle. When the Red Terror is raging, he takes another month off work because, again, he's, the stress has brought a, a breakdown. Again, in the autumn and the winter of 1920. By 1921, he's had his first heart attack. It seems from his behaviour, like the doctors are uh, prescribing amphetamines, He's, he's working 18 to 19 hour days, and he's not eating anything at all. So we've got lots of lists of doctor's orders where they keep trying to make him eat, trying to make him sleep, which he's not doing, and uh, trying to make him take off work. The point is, though, he, does, he refuses all of this help. He deliberately, knowingly, the doctor's telling him, you've got, they tell him in 1922, you've got two or three years left to live if you don't stop this health regime. And he doesn't stop doing what he does. The weekend before he dies, he has a heart attack in late 1925. The weekend before he dies, he has several heart attacks. They found out later on he'd made notes in, book, in his notebooks uh, uh, to, to make a doctor's appointment to see about the heart attacks he's had. So he knowingly works himself to death. I think the key, though, is, is not just then uh, the fact that to be this ferocious yet worship figure, he has to die. It's also there's something on the unconscious level working, which maybe he does admit to at times. This is one of these intriguing pictures that came out in the 1990s, banned at the time. He seems to have set himself up as uh, Jesus in the Last Supper there in the picture. Um, this is a knowing, you know, knowingly sculpted picture. If you look behind his head, there's even a halo in the, in the chair. Uh, uh, this, I'm not the only person to notice this. Andrei Signyavsky said that you know, he, uh, he deliberately based his life on Christ, basically, but a, a kind of uh, atheist Christ that was good at killing people. Uh, that the sacrifice he made was taking the sins on himself so that other people didn't have to do it. So this works. This thing, this successful act of self-sacrifice. Uh, the only person, the only cult of personality which survives, except for Lenin's, throughout the Soviet period is Dzerzhinsky's. These are socialist realist paintings from the 1950s here. They make a death mask of him and keep it like a holy relic in the FSB. They must have it somewhere still now, I think, locked away in some crypts. They've still got his office there preserved. Uh, they particularly dwell on the fact that he, he's, he's someone who's sold to children as a role model, which is, again, a rather disturbing thing. These pictures of him, uh, he built orphanages and uh, saved a lot. Of, they had like four or five million homeless children after the Civil War, and he solved this problem in large part. Uh, the, the picture at the top there is a, is a school book about tales about Dzerzhinsky. Imagine, imagine this for children, that terrifying cover that keep you awake at night. It, so it's, it's a role model which lasts until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And even more strange this works is the fact that it's lasted beyond. You've even got a branch of the Wall Street Journal, Smart Money it's called, but it's a Russian uh, magazine, saying that KGB is better than an MBA, meaning a KGB education is, 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 is ideal for the world of business. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they got caught with this picture on their, their album in 2002, the FSB. They had this, that, that photograph there on their album of the Lubyanka and said, um, you've still got the statue of Dzerzhinsky up there. And they, you know, they got into a bit of trouble about this. I even like the fact that they have linked it to superheroes in the magazine article in the, in the, the smart money thing. They had lots of flying superhero Dzerzhinskys in the article, which, again, seemed to uh, underpin my point. So the fact is then, uh, the, the author of Dzerzhinsky's de demise was Felix Dzerzhinsky himself in an attempt to create this kind of iconic role model. 
Uh, one thing that's um, odd is that he seemed to have this death wish, though, before he created, and this is the final postscript I'll say, which we can then talk about it further. He seemed to have had this death wish before 1917. Uh, in 1901, and this, this might be the root of it, uh, he's diagnosed with TB. He, he writes to his sister about this and says, you know, this has changed my world view. I can now neither love nor hate by hearts. It, 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 this, 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 this leads to a kind of Manichean worldview of good and evil. And he sees himself as living between life and death. Uh, I'll, I'll give a quote, maybe, of more of the letter, if I dig it out. He, he writes to his sister and says, Ho, hum, he who lives as I do cannot live very long. Uh, he goes on to say that bouts of depression are followed by feelings of being on top of the world. Uh, the most interesting thing I think he finds, though, uh, I find, though, is that um, he seems, again, if we go back to Khrushchev's analogy, he seems to be projecting uh, his own inner hypochondria, I think, onto the outside world when he talks about the fact that I am the carrier of an enemy within, an enemy who's constantly on the go, who may relinquish, relinquish his attacks for a moment only to renew the struggle later on. Uh, so, part of this death wish then is his, him trying to tackle with the inevitability of his own death and to make something meaningful of his life. We can see the death wish kick in then as well, though, in the fact that he regularly is um, in, involved in violence, uh, beatings in prison. He gets himself uh, regularly throws himself in the way uh, of trouble uh, in bar fights when he's trying to proselytize the re revolution. There's lots of stories about this. In 1918, uh, he quite famously virtually off offers himself as a human sacrifice uh, when the left SRs try to overthrow the regime. Dzerzhinsky just walks into their headquarters and tells them all to put their guns down and stop being silly. He's basically just inviting them to kill him. Instead, they just take the gun off him and put him in a cellar and keep him prisoner there. He's, he's incredibly remorseful when the, um, the le left SRs are overthrown and he's not killed. Apparently, he sort of screams at the people who liberate him, why didn't they kill me? My, my, my life would have had some meaning then. Uh, he famously gets drunk on New Year's Eve in uh, 1918 and begs Lenin and Stalin to shoot him uh, because of all the, all the killing he's done in the cause of the revolution. He says he doesn't deserve to live. So this is part of a kind of pathological behaviour which I think dates back to his diagnosis with TB. And I think that's where you know, the final conclusion then of the... Uh, and, the and the nice thing is this happens just at midnight. Um, uh, they, they do it by time. It's nice in the autopsy in the archives that are found. And they think just after midnight, they pull the lungs out of his chest. It's not wonderfully gory the way they describe it. And they discover that his pulmonary organs were perfectly healthy. Uh, there were no signs of damage. Um, now, even those who've developed symptoms of TB uh, will have some kind of scarring on the lungs. Uh, uh, now, you could say that... Uh, uh, you know, they missed it or something like that. But this is even a nicer thing which I like about the Cluedo story, really, is, is that, that is, um, the, the, the guy who carries out his autopsy, his name is um, Professor Abrakosov, which means Professor Apricot uh, in English. So <laughs> Professor Apricot with the scalpel in the mortuary uh, finds in his lungs that there's no damage whatsoever. And now Professor Apricot, the important thing about him is he's the world's leading expert on TB. So if Dzerzhinsky had had TB, uh, he would have known. So the intriguing thing is that... Felix Dzerzhinsky based this whole passion play, this whole self-sacrifice, on a false premise. There was actually no enemy within. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ian. Cheers. Um, um, Rachel, would you like to speak? And then we'll, we'll open up for a session. Thank you. <coughs> Well, first of all, Dr. Laughlin, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I think it was a, a really interesting, and especially this idea of a narrative framework. It's kind of a classic murder mystery, um, thinking about how events unfold, and, and, and the importance also, and the crucial role of contextualizing them, especially if you're a historian, um, to avoid projecting backwards in time, um, because we would be at a fault, I think, and a disadvantage to in trying to understand and research conspiracy theories if we don't do this, this kind of important work um, and, and give this consideration. Um, well, you pointed out today, I think, how uncovering the actual history of assassination, uh, scholars are faced with a multifaceted dilemma. So on the one side, seeking to unearth what actually happened as opposed to the perceived occurrence of events, who or which groups were responsible or widely blamed, uh, what indeed took place or might have taken place, where said events transpired or were reported to have done so, 
and when precisely, or imprecisely as it goes, and perhaps most centrally, why? So Cluedo kind of uh, is a nice uh, way to describe this. Um, but as historians, we're often confronted with the impasse of exploring historical truth and seeking to illustrate how various and often diverse and divergent variations of the truth help us to narrate and argue a historical story. It's a messy business, all the richer helping us to, to look at unanswered questions and the complex stories we seek to tell. These, as you imply, have all the makings of a classic scripted murder mystery. Um, so I want to, to abuse my position responding to the paper and pose a few questions, uh, as usual. Um, and I want to start out with the question of Dzerzhinsky himself as a fascinating lead character. So really what Dzerzhinsky does is bridge together three eras of political rule, from the Tsarist Romanov Empire to Lenin's Revolutionary Guard, and finally Stalin's clique, forged around this man of steel. He also embodies three distinct personas that exemplify these political regimes. From the archetypal Bolshevik and veteran of revolutionary movement in Imperial Russia, to playing a key part, key part excuse me, in the Bolshevik coup. And finally, as a firm member of the new establishment, founding famed Cheka. Well, I, I want to ask about how peculiar is Dershinsky, and, and how much does his peculiar history matter for stimulating conspiracy theories in the aftermath of this? Um, right, you mentioned his, his kind of hypochondriac <coughs> nature, his wish for martyrdom, uh, these really fabulous and, and uh, enlightening details about his actual self. Um, and we should also consider the fact that at, at this point in time, the, the civil war between the whites and the reds had shortly kind of finished or, or, or could have said to have come to an end. Um, although some scholars would argue that civil war continues up through 1928, with the beginning of Stalin's first five-year plan. Um, or even goes on through the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so that's, that's a historian's argument uh, that we can talk about later. But I want to ask about, about where personalities sit in this kind of story that you're telling. So I'm thinking about other famous, famously assassinated people in history. So Jean-Paul Marat during the French Revolution, for instance, killed in his bath famously by Charlotte Corday. So we knew then kind of the where, why, and how, but, but the kind of conspiracy theories that this throws on the revolution as a whole. Um, and, and doubts that it sends them. Um, or, for instance, in, in early uh, 19th century in Germany, when Karl Sand assassinates August von Kotzebue, um, and, and the kind of implications this has for conspiracy theories about different divergent groups in society, uh, and this kind of question of, of, of where that sits. Um, so I want to think about whether it's something also peculiarly Russian as part of the first, first question. Um, and we recently had Peter Pomerantz come to talk to us, and I think he would have one opinion, I'm curious about yours, um, but this role of personas also continues, as you mentioned, with the question of Stalin as the kind of accuser, but also perpetrator of a lot of this kind of violence. Um, and as a kind of second question as part of the first question, um, I want to ask where this sits in the history of wet ops, the kind of slang for assassinations, kidnappings, and sabotage, uh, which became an indispensable component of the official Czechy Argo, along with penetration and clandestine work. Um, so, for instance, the, this kind of assassination of foreign threats abroad, most importantly white Russians uh, who had been affiliated with the, the revolution, um, but on the other side of the Reds. Um, but, but mainly this kind of role of, of personalities and whether there's a Russian element that's crucial to think about here. Uh, the second question I want to ask is about where this sits in the history of media and conspiracy theories. This is something our group has discussed widely. Um, since, since our beginning a few years ago. And, you know, this kind of question of, of the cult of personality and how, how this plays a part in conspiracy theories in the modern age. Uh, as you mentioned, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany was famously conscious of, of his persona and how he was presented in, in pictures and in film, uh, in particular always hiding his withered left arm. Um, and Queen Victoria was famously known also as the first media monarch, um, the, the title of John Plankett's book on her. Um, but this starts also, also a bit earlier, if you think about Louis XIV, the kind of sun king uh, in, in France. So I, I want to know how things are changing, because this film clip was really fascinating that you showed in all of these images, right? This is, is, a, is a kind of game changer or not. Um, and the third piece that I wanted to bring up is the questions of perceptions and trust and the relationship between paranoia and suspicion, conspiracy theories, but the broader lens here should be politics and violence, I think. Um, 
And of course, Russia was something very peculiar in this, right? This is the, the land of Rasputin, and this fantastic uh, quote you had from 1926 in the Times, you know, the mistrust, the official announcements, the whispers and rumors of violent death. Um, so this kind of connection between violence and conspiracy and conspiracy theory, if you could say something more about that. So I will open the floor now to questions. You're free to answer any of those, or we can uh, sure. start off with a question from the audience. Sure. Once you have a go yeah, first. I'll go for a sec. Yeah, I mean, th th there's two things, I suppose. Yes, there are peculiarly Russian features, and there are quite clearly uh, not peculiarly Russian features. Uh, the peculiarly Russian ones are, uh, but you might have this in France, I suppose, is the existence of the emigrate, emigrates, uh, the is existence of Russia abroad. And one thing is, this is a product, this whole conspiracy theory, of Russophobia. Mm -hmm. And what you have is a very long tradition in Russia of... Uh, um, the, the people who flee Russia are creating a, a, a very dark and a very menacing image of the Russian regime, whether it be Putin, whether it be uh, the Soviet regime, whether it be the Tsarist regime before that. So that's a particularly Russian component, is that there's a, you know, people who are in the know who, who gossip. And there's the thing as well about closed government, which Russia has, you know, the fact that the Kremlin is the, the locked room kind of thing. People have to project onto what's going on because they're just not giving them all the information. The things that aren't peculiarly Russian is that it's quite clearly goes in the, into the revolutionary tradition uh, in one sense. Uh, you know, that there's lots of parallels to um, the French Revolution, Marat and Robespierre. Uh, they themselves are very conscious of these, these kind of parallels. Uh, uh, so it, it, and Felix Dzerzhinsky himself is, is not from the Russian tradition. He's Polish. Uh, he's in Russia by accident. He's sort of shipwrecked there because he's in a czarist prison when the revolution happens. And of course, Poland don't want him back after and not surprisingly, and they, he's certainly not very welcome when he invades the country in 1920. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't help that uh, you know, he's, he's already had the Red Terror in Russia, and then so they just don't want anything to do with him. And he didn't like Polish nationalism at all. He was, he was very pro-Jewish. He learned uh, Yiddish and so forth. Uh, and he was not typically did dislike Polish uh, anti-Semitism. So he, he was not a friend of Polish nationalism. He was not a friend of uh, nationalism full stop, which, uh, which is causes him to fall out with Lenin. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very much a, uh, a mistake to see this as something peculiarly Russian, I think, in some ways, that uh, too often Russia gets seen as sort of outside the norm, but so much of it, it's, you know, he's plugged into so many of the currents of the time, the cult of personality, uh, the, the, the politician as actor, uh, 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 the, the idea of creating a narrative as well to behind to, to create their popularity, I think is very typical. Uh, the, the, the fact of the success, though, is odd, isn't it? You know, the secret police chiefs are not cult figures in other countries. Maybe Wolf in East Germany was, but uh, in general, they, they, they live in the shadows. Not Dzerzhinsky, he lived in the limelight. He was, he was well known, that, that image of him, you know, when they, they put it in the newspapers. He's been forgotten by us in the West, but he's, he's not been forgotten in Russia. He's still, a, he's still a catchphrase, really. He's still a, a name that conjures up an image and, and, and carries with it a whole load of semantic weight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, the footage is also uh, very, uh, very interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask you actually about the Stalin and Stalin's role. I, I mean, it seems what, like what you're saying here is uh, that Stalin was not paranoid during this time. Yeah. And to me, I, I don't understand that because not only has uh, Russia, like Tsarist Russia, <coughs> lost the war. Yeah. In World War One, but also a civil war was taking part. Yeah. Stalin and his comrades were taking part in that, and there was also like splits within like the the, the sort of communists. There were yeah. Mensheviks yeah. and Bolsheviks. Yeah. So it seems to be like you know a lot of components for creating paranoia. That yeah. said, a year after like you know uh, Stalin sort of uh, marginalizes the leaders of the communist part, uh, mm. the, the sort of like his movement, the Bolsheviks, yeah. Trotsky yeah. and uh, Kamenev, I think. So. I mean, yeah. Would you, would you be able to yeah, 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 like, yeah. I, I would say that um, uh, Stalin, at this point in time, is there's some paranoia, which is that he believes that the capitalist world is out to destroy him, and Dzerzhinsky is com in complete agreement with him, with him on that. Uh, the reason why Dzerzhinsky's uh, in a depressed mood in, in June and July of 1926 is that Pilsudski has sort of started a dictatorship in Poland, that they failed in a communist uprising in, in Estonia. Uh, uh, the, the Soviet ambassador will later be killed, but Dzerzhinsky already thinks in 1926 that Poland are about to invade in, in alliance with Romania. Nobody else goes this extreme. So Stalin isn't at the most extreme of paranoid people there. And I think that Stalin's paranoia is a product of his position in many ways, that um, he's no more than 
uh, usually paranoid, I would say, for the, the, the movement he's in at that point in time. And the, but it's just that he becomes increasingly isolated inside the party. At this point in time, he's still socialising with the leaders of the party. He's still friends with people like Bukhari. Uh, later on, he will only have people who are absolute lackeys towards him. Uh, at this point in time, he's still got his wife, who just walk, works in a, in a normal job, has a normal life, and comes back to him and will nag him about you know, the things he's doing and the negative impact he's going to have. And this will go on until her suicide in 32. It's part of the component why she commits suicide, is they don't agree about politics. She, she's more sympathetic to Bukhari. He, Stalin sees, you know, this is the way he does, you can see he's become jaundiced by her suicide when he talks about it as a betrayal. He's not, he's not sort of, uh, uh, well, he is upset about her death, but he's more angry about her death than anything else. It sees as a kind of act of passive aggression. She was, she was a very bipolar person, and he found her very tiring indeed. She went through periods of terrible depression and, and then terrible periods of kind of hyperactivity and rage with him, and he found her a bit difficult to handle. But that, that, the loss of her in 32 is when I see his paranoia really beginning, because he becomes socially isolated. He stops living a normal life. He only li works and talks to people who are, who are in absolute agreement with him inside the Politburo. You know, he doesn't travel anywhere, Stalin. You know, it's a very interesting thing. He goes to... He goes to Siberia in 1928. He goes to visit his mother in 1936, where she says she's very disappointed that he didn't become a priest. And he, and he, he whines, why did, you, why did you beat your mother? And she said, well, you didn't turn out too bad, did you? What, are you the czar or something? And he's like, yeah, something like that. Um, he doesn't bother to even go to a funeral later on. You know, uh, in the Second World War, uh, he goes to the front line once to see action there, and apparently has an, an attack of uh, you know, uh, deli belly, and uh, and he's, it, uh, he he just has to uh, he doesn't like uh, extreme violence at the front line, so he, he's not like Churchill. He doesn't fly everywhere and, and and see the war firsthand. He doesn't travel around. He lives inside that Kremlin bubble, and he travels between the Kremlin and the Caucasus. And in the summers up to thirty six, he goes on holiday to the Caucasus. When he really enters the paranoid world, then. He's from 36 onwards. He doesn't even go on holiday anymore. He just lives inside the Kremlin. By that point in time, he's got maps in his car and he's giving advice to his chauffeur to uh, take different routes to his dacha on the edge of the city every day. Instead of before, he's walking around the city. He's not worried at all. From that point, he's, worried. he's, got, he's got tanks defending him. He's got armed guards. He's living in a bomb-proof uh, bunker virtually. He's become a very different person from the person in the 1920s. It's fascinating. It's reminding me of uh, Neil Long, 1881 after the assassination. Yeah. Bizarre, where the same thing happens. Yeah, it changes. Yeah. Another idea of Paul, what's interesting about Wojcicki too, is that he was a Polish nobleman. Yeah. Uh, I believe he was a member of the Social Democrat Party of the King of Poland, Lithuania. Yeah. And uh, what we should bear in mind is that Lenin, in particular, was very keen for Wojcicki to take over in Cheka. One, because he'd suffered so terribly in Tsarist prisons. Mm -hmm. This would help him to be accommodated and understand him. And two, because of the more or less universal conviction amongst the leadership that he was honest yeah. and that he would not turn against the party. Yeah. And by and large, under Dzerzhinsky, the Czechar did not turn against the party. Yeah. That happened much later. Yeah. Yeah. But what I really wanted to do, I'm a bit worried about these notions of paranoia that are being bandied about. Okay. And paranoia is a medical condition, which is an you know, unreasoning True. fear of the unknown. If we try and put ourselves back in the heads of these people, which is extremely difficult, most of them, not the old guard like Lenin, mm -hmm. but most of the second generation from youth, have been living underground lives. They've been at risk of imprisonment, torture, beating, or killing. They're a bit like Islamic militants on the run. Mm. They don't know who to trust. They don't know who in the party is a, an informant for the Tsarist secret police. They've got lots of non diplomats They have to live this underground world. And then they go through not only the stress of that world for a decade or two, but then the immense stress <coughs> of the civil war and the revolution when comrades fall by the wayside or become traitors or go with the opposition. It's, what surprises me is not that this suspicion explodes in the 30s mm. after the tremendous disasters of collectivization that it isn't actually there in the 20s. Yeah. That yeah. party leaders, Stalin, mm -hmm. Trotsky, wander freely about the streets of yeah. Moscow and Petersburg, but at any rate, without too much fear. Yeah. I mean, Lenin, when he gets shot, has, has no bodyguards. Yeah. Because they see themselves as part of the masses, and so, yeah, yeah. they... they 
uh, they, they, they see themselves as a new kind of politician who doesn't need that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's very true. Uh, and, 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 you know, Stalin is very typical of them in that sense. They're not, uh, you know, Lenin goes to work on the tram the day after the October yeah. Revolution. Uh, 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 he, several times he gets mugged and things like that in 1918 because n nobody knows who he is. When he, when he stands up to speak in the Soviet in, in, in the July of, of 1917 or June, uh, someone steals his wallet and his revolver. You know, he's sort of, uh, yeah. You know, these are, they, they, yeah, they see themselves as quite normal people. Yeah, I think the paranoia is something that, you know, I use it in a non-medical sense. It, it's an excessive caution, an excessive belief. And, and Dzerzhinsky does suffer it on the foreign policy context that when, uh, you know, when, when foreign policy developments don't go their way, he keeps saying, I see the hand of, of Britain and France. And there's no evidence whatsoever that Britain and France are involved. But he sees um, uh, any kind of negative developments in foreign policy as part of some kind of British plot, uh, which is, you know, even Kronstadt, he, bla he blames, on, blames on the British and the French. Uh, so he, uh, I mean, in the non-medical sense, that he, he 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 leaps to conclusions for which there are no there's no evidence whatsoever. Um, and yeah, it's not surprising at all that they've, they've lived a life on the run. And, and Jasinski blames his uh, arrests on uh, betrayal. He doesn't he doesn't think he's caught because he's he's just not very good at um, hiding his identity, which is probably really the truth often. But he blames it on the fact that informers have um, betrayed him. And, and Stalin himself, yeah, Roman Malinovsky is the, the guy who's responsible for Stalin going to prison in 1912. So he is a victim of an informer. Um, going back to my point about the Stasi Museum. Yeah. He, he, if he, if he, in that museum, it looks as though he was a revered figure. Yeah, he was. Yeah. And that was that's right through the 50s. Yeah. And uh, because uh, I think yes, yeah, it's, it's it's the sense that and uh, this is that strange paradox. They like the paradox of him, that they know someone's got to break eggs to make the omelet. Uh, uh, but you know, th they they don't want a person who enjoys breaking eggs. They don't want someone who enjoys it. The fact he hated the job, the fact that he had a tortured conscience, and uh, before as a child they said wouldn't hurt a fly. Uh, that that's what they find. They love that paradox about him. That that's the kind of guy we need. Someone who doesn't want this job. Uh, uh, and, uh, and and I think it's true. He didn't enjoy it. He does. He d hence um, hence his insomnia. Hence his uh, various mental and, and physical ha breakdowns. That uh, he knows. He doesn't want to give the job to someone else either, though, because he knows that someone else who gets it might be a kind of person who likes the job, and that's just not something he wants to see. So that's why that's why for many people he represents some kind of you know uh, watershed moment when he dies, because uh, we don't know what would happen had he stayed alive. But certainly, it doesn't turn out very well after he dies. So, uh, but he's very different from Beria. Very much, yeah. I mean, Beria's a sadist. He's a serial rapist. He's uh, Stalin wouldn't even leave his daughter alone with Beria. And he, Stalin knows what what kind of uh, stuff Beria's made of. But Beria, as well, his personality seems to disintegrate as a result of doing the job. He keeps trying to give up the job in the 1920s, but eventually gets to like the power. I think. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just getting back to the paranoia, I mean, uh, we were talking about this before, that mm -hmm. we're kind of like, when we discuss these things, we still kind of like move in the shadow of uh, this notion of the paranoid star. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to mention that there was actually uh, an earlier attempt to deal with this phenomenon of uh, well, it's a conspiracy theories mm -hmm. on a psychological level mm -hmm. um, back in 1954 with uh, Franz Neumann, who wrote an essay called Anxiety in Politics, and so he's not mm -hmm. using the concept of paranoia, but rather yeah. at that stage, anxiety. And the interesting thing about the essay is that the first part of it is a little bit about anxiety, refers to notions of alienation, which mm -hmm. uh, are kind of like at the root of anxiety. He then moves to the notion of the, the, mass, the, the cult of the personality. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, he uses Freud and mass psychology there. Uh, and the final part is then looking at conspiracy theories. And he goes through yeah. history. It's kind of one of the first examples of someone saying, hey, there is not only with the mass per personality this kind of sociological phenomenon, not, so, not yeah. purely historical phenomenon, but something which reappears in different yeah. societies with the same dynamic. And then he notices that also with conspiracy theories, and he's actually one of the first people to actually use the term conspiracy theory. Yeah. Um, and what he doesn't do, it, he wrote it and then a few days, uh, a few months later he died in a car crash, and so you can kind of <laughs> see that he was still developing the thoughts, um, and there's no conspiracy theory. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I was, I was laughing. Yeah. <laughs> but he was trying to get these things, to bring them into some kind of alignment, because he could sense that there was some kind of connection between the yeah. cult of the personality and conspiracy theories. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, 
Can you kind of like, do you have any comments about that? What is this yeah. kind of like, why do we find in these societies uh, which are devoted to a kind of a cult of a personality, yeah. why are they so susceptible to conspiracy theories? Um, I suppose it's one kind of conspiracy theory which is, imagines history as a kind of uh, a, a drama involving great figures. Uh, so we, we develop we develop in the world of a kind of soap opera plot, really, where you know things have to happen not because of the movement of social forces, not because but because of individual animosities and individual dislikes. So so the the centre ground collapses in 1926, not because there's there's no basis for NEP to sort of build a working possibility of of an industrial revolution in an overwhelmingly agrarian country, but it collapses because somebody's poisoned. Uh, you know, it, ca it collapses because there's some kind of palace coup that goes on. Uh, it, it reduces it to a, a very kind of old-fashioned sort of conspiracy theory, which is a, a kind of, a, you know, the sort of Renaissance court, you know, the idea of poisonous and, and assassins. Uh, and it's very much, so that's why, you know, the, around assassination in the 19th century, it happens mostly in countries which devolve a lot of power and authority, not on an institution, but on an individual, on a person. You know, and, and so Jashinsky uh, uh, attracts that because, as well, it's not, the, it's not the position of head of the secret police, it's the fact that he's such a saintly figure, it's, it's his personality which uh, attracts that. Fantastic. It's, uh, looking forward to keeping the discussion. Yeah, 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 I'd like to uh, talk more about that um, source as well, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, please join me in thanking Jashinsky.